we are in the infancy of a series called The Shepherd King Lessons from the Life of David. And today's presentation will be the second installment talking about spirit filled music. I remember reading about George Frederick Handel, the uh, composer of that famous song, The Messiah, and many others, that uh, he was just a a very talented organist and one day when he was visiting a church in another city at the conclusion of the sermon you know the organist used to what they call play the people out and we call it a postlude and uh, he went over to the organist he said do you mind if I play the people out he said oh please it is customary he said you know visiting organist you be happy to well he sat down and he began to play and as the ushers went up the aisle to ush people out nobody got up because the music was just so mesmerizing and so enchanting and so thrilling that they all stayed there and he played on for quite a while and then eventually the the local organist either got hungry or he got jealous and he said well I don't think you're gonna do a very good job of playing them out maybe I should take over <laughs> and he said hey, absolutely and he handed back the organ and as soon as he started playing the people got up and left uh, music does have a power and it can draw, it can repel, it can inspire in good ways and bad. You remember in our last presentation we were talking about David, uh, uh, David was anointed as king and Samuel made that special clandestine visit there to Bethlehem to anoint David as king when there's still a king on the throne who had by the way also been chosen by God and filled by the Spirit of God several years earlier. And so it says here after he took the horn of oil, I'm in verse 13, again 1 Samuel 16 verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil, he anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and he went to Ramah, he said I've got to get out of here because I've just, it could be viewed as treason to anoint another king while well, there is a sitting king on the throne. But notice verse 14. But, it says the Holy Spirit comes on David, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now this is a very important verse. David is spirit filled, but then it says the Spirit departed from Saul. And that manifested itself a number of ways. You can read, for instance, in the writings of Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. He said he represented that uh, Saul became demon possessed at this point. He was almost suffocated and strangled, as well as distracted at his counsels. He became weak and foolish. He lost courage and greatness of mind. He was timorous, meaning fearful, and alarmed by everything. And he was full of envy and suspicion, rage, and despair. And as you read out in the remaining chapters of First Samuel, you see that a lot of that proved to be true. How sad to have the words written, the Spirit departed. That tells us that God can give His Spirit to somebody and He can take it away. That's a very important point because, you know, there's a good segment of dear Christians that believe that once you're saved and Spirit-filled, you cannot be lost. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And these words are in the sacred record as a warning for all of us so that we will know that we need to guard against grieving the Spirit and do everything in our lives to embrace and to welcome the Spirit to be in our lives. Again, it says in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now the only reason Paul would say do not grieve the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit can be grieved and when you completely and finally grieve the Spirit away then you've done what is defined as committing the unpardonable sin. Now I don't believe Saul had done that yet. It is possible to grieve away the Spirit or to grieve the Holy Spirit. It is possible to be even spirit or demon possessed and not be finally lost. Didn't Jesus save people that seemed utterly demon-possessed. You know the story about the demoniac there by 
the Sea of Galilee that ran around naked, dragging broken chains and cutting himself and crying and living with pigs and living in a cemetery. And I mean, that, that guy was pretty far gone. And Jesus saved him and turned him into an evangelist. Mary Magdalene had seven devils cast out of her. And so there are people who, like the prodigal, they knew God, they were in the Father's house, they wandered away, they end up in the pig pen, and they can be saved again. But there is a point of no return. And before the story is over, I'm sad to say, what you probably already know, Saul ultimately does reach the point of no return. But I don't think he was there yet. But it is a scary thing to think that you could grieve away the spirit, and it's possible to do it and not know it. You read, for instance, the story of Samson. Judges 16, verse 19, a very famous passage. She, Delilah, lulled him to sleep on her knees, and she called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Remember, it was the Spirit of the Lord came on Samson, gave him that supernatural strength, and she said as a test, the Philistines are on you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as other times and I'll shake myself free with a supernatural strength. And this is the, the verses that you shouldn't miss. But he did not know the Lord had departed from him. There are those words again. What happened after the Holy Spirit came on David? It says, but the Spirit departed from Saul. You know, I don't know if that frightens you, friends, but it frightens me. The thought makes me shudder that I might grieve away the Spirit and not know it. You wonder how many... Saul continued as king for years. Is it possible for people to go through all kinds of religious ceremonies and rituals and not even know they're doing it without the Holy Spirit? Saul continued in the office as king. And the priests that condemned and crucified Jesus continued with all the rituals of religion, devoid of the Spirit. I read a quote once that uh, probably 80% of what happens in churches happen without the Spirit's involvement. There's all kinds of things that can go on that the Holy Spirit is not doing. That's why David, when he prayed, David knew what had happened to Saul. Psalm 51, when David sinned with Bathsheba, you know what his big fear was? He said, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And I want to direct you to 1 Chronicles 17, 13. Nathan the prophet comes to talk to David. He's talking about your son is going to build a temple, Solomon. And this is what Nathan says. I will be his father, speaking of Solomon. He will be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who is before you. Who's that? Saul. God, Nathan is telling David. God is telling David through Nathan. I'm going to be with your son until he finishes his house, I will not take my spirit from him, as my mercy from him, as I did from him who is before you. So the spirit of the Lord, the mercy of God, the grace of God was taken from Saul and it left him in shatters. Now are there others in the Bible that had that experience? Was Balaam a spirit-filled prophet? Was he? But at one point he was. But he began to covet the rewards of Balak, the king of the Moabites, and eventually grieved away the spirit, and he was killed by Israel in a battle. And the Bible talks a lot about Balaam. What about Judas? You know, the Bible says Jesus sent out the 12 apostles preaching and teaching while he was still alive. Jesus sent them on miss missionary endeavors, and it says they came back and said, praise the Lord, even the devils are subject to us. And don't think for a moment that Judas wasn't inspired at moments. And, but you know what you read in the Bible that uh, at one point the Holy Spirit left Judas and he committed the unpardonable sin. You can also read about Demas in the New Testament. Paul says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. And so I'm not saying that to frighten you. It's just really, it, it's an important uh, warning that we ought to be aware that yes, once you're saved, you can be spirit-filled, you can be saved, but that relationship with God and the Holy Spirit must be nurtured. If you persist in rebellion, what happened to Saul can happen to you. What happened to Samson and Balaam and Judas can happen to you. Now Samson, he repented at the end. Saul did not. 
Now, this then begs another important question. The wording here that you find is a little bit uh, concerning for some people. You notice what it says in verse 14. It says, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. A distressing spirit from the Lord? Does God send evil spirits? This is a passage that often makes people wonder. Well, some of this actually just comes from the way that the, the Old Testament and the Hebrews understood that God is all sovereign, and He is. And so the devil can't do anything without the Lord at least loosening his leash. He has to give him permission. As in the story of Job, it says that uh, God said to the devil, it was the devil that harassed Job, not the Lord, but God had to say, all right, I'm going to give you a certain amount of liberty, but there's limits. That reminds me of the verse that you find where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. God must allow limits on temptation, but does God tempt? No. I want to read another verse. James 1.13, Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So is that clear? God doesn't tempt anyone. And God will measure. He'll make sure that the devil is not allowed to tempt you above what you're able. So don't ever say, oh Lord, I gave in because I just couldn't help it. Yes, you can. Because God promises that He's not going to tempt you above what you're able to resist with His power. Amen? If you'll access the power that He makes available. So you can also see another example when um, all these false prophets had gathered before King Jehoshaphat and Ahab and uh, Micaiah the prophet said, and this is 1 Kings 22, 23, Look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours and the Lord has declared disaster against you. The Lord put a lying spirit? Now when you read the whole story it says that God allowed these spirits to go to Ahab and deceive him. God didn't send the spirits. The spirits went of their own volition. You see, God is always protecting us. God has a hedge about us. But sometimes there's a break in the hedge if we reject God. Let me give you one more verse just to tie that off. I want to make sure everyone's clear on this. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. The coming of the lawless one according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. That's that lying spirit says, three unclean spirits like devils go forth to the kings of the earth to deceive. And with all unrighteousness and deception among them who perish. Why? Here's a part. Because they did not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see how it works? God gives you the Holy Spirit. Welcome, nurture the Holy Spirit. Reject the Holy Spirit. There is a vacuum that the devil will fill. You know, if it rains on good soil, something's going to grow. If you don't nurture what grows, you're going to get weeds. But something's going to grow. Your heart is not a vacuum. And if you don't have God and His Spirit inside, there's only one other alternative. You, know, you remember reading the story where Jesus said this man had the evil spirits cast out, an evil spirit cast out, but he did not replace it with anything good, and the evil spirit came back. He said, look, my house is empty. It swept and vacuumed, and he brought seven other spirits worse than the first. And so it's not neutral. There's no Switzerland in this battle between good and evil that you can say, I just want to, I'm going to sit on the sidelines. I don't want to be involved. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. And so when the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, what's left? If darkness should leave this room, what happens? I'm sorry, no. If light leaves this room, darkness comes in. And if you want to get the darkness out, you don't use a snow shovel. You simply bring in the light, the darkness goes out. And our hearts are something like that. They're never just neutral. So, as a result of this, Saul is, he's terribly troubled. I agree with what Josephus said, that he became jealous, he became raging, he became, you know, one reason. Samuel had gone to King Saul and said, because of your unfaithfulness, I'm taking the kingdom from you 
and from your dynasty, and I'm going to give it to your neighbor who's better than you. The Lord has sought out a man whose heart is after his own heart. Now, wh what is Saul thinking? Somewhere out there in my kingdom is my replacement. And he was brooding, and he was jealous, and he, instead of repenting and humbling himself, he tried to stop it from happening. And he was fretful, and he, he just had totally the wrong attitude. He's blaming God and saying, this isn't fair, and it's my prerogative to be king. And who knows what he was thinking, but uh, an evil spirit had come into his mind. And, and it might not have been all physical. Sometimes circumstances can try upon you and stresses and different things. It may not have been all spiritual. Um, but it's like there's this old proverb that says, Satan likes to fish in troubled waters. Saul had became, become so troubled by these things that it gave the devil an advantage. And so some demonic harassment takes advantage of physical weakness. That was very important. Did you catch that? There are people who are harassed by the devil, and the devil makes the most of what may be physical or mental weaknesses to take advantage. Is that true? I believe so. So what's the fallout from this? His servants see that Saul is brooding and he's difficult and he's unhappy and he's kind of he goes into fits and he seems like he, he's lost his confidence, he's lost his courage. And it says, then one of his servants, I'm in verse 18, answered and said, look, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Look at the irony of God. Who is skillful in playing. This is the first reference we hear that he's skillful in playing, in particular the harp. We got a, a beautiful example of an ancient harp up here. One of the sons of Jesse, skillful in playing. Now listen to this. What a, what a wonderful recommendation is given here. A mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Wow. How would you like to have a recommendation like that? He's talented, brave, patriotic. Matter of fact, I heard one pastor sum it up this way. He talks about his person, his pastime, music, his patriotism, he's from Bethlehem, his prudence, his piety, his power. Talks about all this in one verse about David. Now, even though David is keeping sheep, you'll notice we don't know how much time passed between the spirit filling David and an evil spirit filling Saul. Months, maybe even years went by. David just stayed with the sheep and he waiting on God's timing. Sometime during the course of why David's taking care of the sheep, a bear comes, a lion comes. We'll talk about that more next week. Word got out, this is a brave young man. Now, I know some of you are wondering, you know that song, Only a Boy Named David? And how many of you have seen illustrations of David and Goliath where, you know, looks like David is about eight years old? That's great for teaching Sabbath school. But it's not accurate. Um, see, in the Hebrew law, you could not be a soldier. Couldn't even be a soldier until you were 20. In a lot of countries, they need all the military they can get, and they say 18. And, it's, it, and uh, the more desperate they get, during the Civil War, there were 14-year-olds that went out there. And when Hitler's forces were just decimated, they had the Hitler youth, and Hitler was sending out 12-year-olds to fight and defend the homeland. And, and they kept lowering the age. But, you know, God realized that you, you've got to have a little bit of uh, fuzz on your chin before you can go, you know, be part of the soldier, uh, the army. And so uh, David wasn't quite 20 yet, but he wasn't 12. There's a lot of debate when you look at how long Saul reigned, how old Samuel was. There are some, it tells us David was 30 when he began to reign, and you do some of the math. And I don't have time to map that all out for you, but I think the evidence is pretty good that David was probably somewhere between 17 and 19 at this point. And uh, he ran from Saul for several years, and he finally gets coronated when he's 30. But David had already demonstrated some valor, and it says he's a mighty man. He, you know, he was at the verge where he was being called a man, but uh, he wasn't a little boy at this point. So it tells us that he was talented, he was musical, and he didn't just have the ability to play music. It says he's skillful. 
Now, everybody loves music, and we're going to spend some time talking about music. And I'm just wondering, how many of you out there play an instrument? Let me see your hands. How many of you like to sing? How many of you like to sing, but you don't sing very well? <laughs> Heard about this lady, and for her daughter's birthday, she bought her piano lessons. And uh, uh, a few days later, her friend came over and said, how are your daughter's lessons going? She said, well, I bought her a clarinet. And she said, well, I thought she was doing okay with the piano. She said, she was, but she can't sing with the clarinet. <laughs> she had the gift of piano, but not singing. <laughs> so he says, all right, look, send for David. And so listen to what happens next year. 1 Samuel 16, Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse. Now did Jesse know about David being anointed king? He did because Samuel had to come and get his permission and gather all his kids and it says in the midst of his brethren he was anointed. The brothers knew, the father knew, the immediate family and they probably had to keep that real low key because it's a threat to the kingdom. And then all of a sudden that messenger comes from the palace. Send me David. Now if you're Jesse, would you be nervous? Uh-oh. Did somebody leak some information? How did he find out about uh, David? Uh, is he going to be executed? And so Jesse's a little worried. It says, send me your son. When someone says, give me your son to a father, especially a king that's not balanced, did our father send his son into a world that is ruled by a king that is not balanced? And Jesus is the son of David, isn't he? Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. You know how often we notice that David is with the sheep. He keeps going back and taking care of sheep. I count at least three times it says David went back to the sheep. He took care of the sheep. He was a good shepherd. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And as we go through our series on David, I'm going to often highlight the parallels between David and Jesus, the son of David. He said, send me... Uh, David, and J when Jesse hears that, he says, oh, I better send a gift I, in case he's heard something. I want to, and it says, Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat, and he sent them by his son David to Saul. So here David comes, and he's got bread and wine and a sacrifice. You know what was at the Last Supper? Jesus said, there was bread when they finished the Passover, the sacrifice, and there was the grape juice there, the wine. And so here's David, the son of Jesse. And he's coming and he's bringing these offerings to the palace. Now the irony, you, you just have to stop. When you, and the reason the story of David is so great, it's like the story of Joseph. It's like the last thing you'd expect. He comes to Bethlehem to anoint a king, and the last one they would expect is the one that is chosen. And then the irony that Saul needs to find somebody to help him with his mental distress and of all the people in the kingdom who he might have called upon that had PhDs that could counsel him or skilled musicians that could play for him, guess who gets invited to the palace? God's providence is amazing, isn't it? How he works things out. And so David is called of all people. And uh, now David must be tiptoeing in. And he must have been very cautious and very careful. Something I don't want to rush past. When you looked at the recommendation that's given earlier where it talks about David, not only did it say that he was a man of war, prudent in speech. Now you would think a shepherd boy being articulate and uh, choosing his words carefully and having a good vocabulary. Usually you don't think of a shepherd that way, right? Usually think of a shepherd as being uneducated and not very articulate, but just because you were a shepherd back then, as I mentioned, and they may have been a poor family, but Jesse was a leader in the community. They read the, um, the scriptures in their family. They communicated well. You look at the Psalms that David writes and you find out he had a tremendous, he was a poet, he had a tremendous grasp of language. He communicated and he articulated himself beautifully. And so they said, there's a young man, he has an incredible gift of speech. And it also says he's a good-looking young man. Because, you know, it was typical in ancient kingdoms that they bring into their palace 
people that look good. And I know today we would call that discrimination, but if you want to know the truth, they did it. When kings and queens brought different courtiers and people into their palaces, they said, they would look good in the palace. They wanted the best people, because other dignitaries would come. They said, wow. It's like when the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon, she said, when she saw his servants and their clothing, she was breathtaken. She was breathless is the way it uh, translates. No more spirit left in her. And so they used to want to bring the good-looking people and the art people that could communicate in the palace that would not embarrass the crown. And so they also recommended David that way. So David comes to Saul. He brings this gift. And uh, then in the palace, you read 1 Samuel 16, verse 21. So David came to Saul, and he stood before him. And it says, he, Saul, loved him greatly. Saul looked at him. Now, I don't think he spent a lot of time talking to him, as you'll see later. But he looked at him and said, what a fine-looking young man. And he heard him talk. He said, he's a, a, a very uh, articulate young man. He seems wise. He seems to conduct himself well. And most importantly, he could play. And it says, finally, when he saw him, and maybe he heard him audition, he sends a message back to Jesse. Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. Now here, it's just, you can't, <laughs> it's so amazing. Saul, when he'd have his fits of rage, he was looking out there, scanning the horizon, wondering who out there in the kingdom was the one that was going to replace him. I said, oh man, this is starting to bother me. David, play something. <laughs> and the, the boy, the shepherd boy, who's come to play the harp for him, last person in the world that Saul at first thought might be the one that was going to be his replacement, he invites into the palace. Isn't it amazing how God works? Yes. Saul, be, he'd be pacing back and forth, looking out his window. He'd be wondering, looking at all the, the dignitaries and the warriors and wondering who was going to replace him as king and it started bothering him. He'd say, oh man, I'm distressed by this spirit and, and I'm depressed and bring in David, have him play for me. And there he was, the one that was going to replace him. It was the musician. It just, it, I don't know, is it just me or does that irony, is amazing. So David came and stood before him. And then I want to spend some time on the last verse here or one of the last verses. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14 to 23. And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, and it's talking about this evil spirit would come because God had given permission. He withdrew his protection. And the evil spirits would make the most of Saul's jealousy and his, um, his uh, insecurities. That he began to brood and become depressed and he couldn't get anything done and he wanted to go fight these battles that and he'd just sit there and, and uh, play darts with his spear. David would take a harp and he'd play with his hand and Saul would become refreshed and well and the distressing spirit would depart from him. You know, David is described as the sweet psalmist of Israel. Not only could David play, but David could play and sing. I used to tell Stephen when he was taking piano lessons, I said, you know, I, I wish you'd also take up the, piano, the guitar because you sing beautifully and you can't carry your piano with you. Sorry, Michelle, I'm, I like the guitar. And you can't carry your piano around with you everywhere. And it's kind of interesting, Nathan took guitar lessons, but now he's taking piano, and last time we saw Stephen, Stephen's picking up the guitar. And... We're lucky because both of our boys are good looking and they can sing and play and they are single, if you want to know. <laughs> single bachelors out there. <laughs> but, um, so David could sing. But what was it that he did so that as he's singing, the evil spirits are driven from Saul or at least he's alleviated? Wouldn't you like to hear? You know, you've got 150 Psalms of David so you can read them. But you know, these are the words and there was music that went with them and there were interludes. Sometimes when you're reading in uh, the Psalms, you'll notice you'll run into the word Selah, right? You know what that means? It basically means think on this and they believe that those were uh, scattered throughout the Psalms of David or the Psalms of Asaph and that meant 
meditation. Think about this, and that means that there was a pause. It was like a musical interlude at that point. The problem was they didn't know how to write music the way that was developed in the you know, 15th, 16th century. Well, all the notes and dots, I don't know exactly when they developed that, but to put music down and when the Jews were conquered and scattered, a lot of those melodies were lost. There may be a few songs that the Hebrews sing today that the melodies go all the way back to the time of David, but there's not many. And uh, so we don't really know. But wouldn't you like to hear? Wouldn't it be fun to get to heaven and say, I'd like to get David's CD. <laughs> and I want to hear David play the, the music that could drive the evil spirits from Saul. Wouldn't you like to have just that kind of music? Now, if it's possible to have good godly music that would drive away evil spirits, is it a stretch to believe that there's also very bad music that will invite evil spirits? But you'd be surprised, there's a lot of people that think music's neutral and that it doesn't matter, you know, there's good music, but you just, it's whatever it feels like to you. And if it blesses you, then it must be good. I respectfully disagree. I think music is like theology. A music is a vibration, it communicates just like the words I'm speaking communicate. Different kinds of music communicate different kinds of thoughts and feelings. And there is good music and there is bad music. I'm just wondering, how many of you agree that there, there's music from God? Do you believe there's music from the devil? You know where the difference, we all agree so far, but you know where the difference would come? Is if I said, all right, I want you to show me where to draw the line between the two. You'd be surprised how many Christians out, out there are struggling to live godly lives while they're listening to diabolical music. And they don't realize there's a connection. I've heard some very interesting testimonies of people that say, you know, I've tried to be a Christian for years and finally I became convicted if I would get rid of my rock and roll library. And it was a struggle because they were addicted. And they did. And just a whole new spirit came into their lives. They never really had made the connection. Now, I'm giving you, you know, radical examples here, but there's a lot of nuances in between. And even as I share this with you, I need to tell you, I feel a little insecure because I'm not trained in music. I mean, you know, my mother sang. She was a songwriter. And we had great composers in our house. Some of them were winners of Tony Awards on Broadway. And so we heard just incredible music. Not all of it, all of it godly, very talented. Some was good, some was bad. You know, there, you can have good music and bad words. You can have some bad words and good music. Matter of fact, I've heard some songs out there that um, just outstanding music, but they, the words were awful. And some people think, well, that sanctifies the message. You've got to have both together that are right. And then I've heard some just rock and roll music, and it's just they're howling, they're jumping up and down, they're cracking their guitars over each other's head, and they just say the name Jesus in spirit every time, and you're supposed to be Christian music. I know, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but... There's a lot of people say, we've got we've to give them the music of the world and we'll put some Christian's words in to create a bridge to bring the young people into the church. And so you've got these, these ostensible Christian groups that go out there and they play this Christian rock to create a bridge to bring the young people into the church. But you know what happens is the kids that grow up in the church hear that, it creates a bridge that leads them out. That bridge goes both ways. Well, I don't even sure it goes the right way. Ask me how I feel. But just, and I grew up listening to the music of the world, but I saw what it did to me and what it does to me. I still hear it. Uh, I'm walking through the market. Or you're just, oh, I, I like going to Chipotle. And every now and then I'll take a phone call while I'm there and the music is just sometimes awful. And I've, more than once, I've had to go up and ask him, I said, you know, I like your food, but I don't care for your music. Can you just turn that down a little bit? You want to turn it off? Just turn it down. I can't even talk. Someone will call me, and they'll hear, boom, baka, 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 boom, baka, baka. and they go, Pastor Doug, where are you? <laughs> and I, always, now I'm self-conscious, you know, I pick up the phone, I go, look, I can't help it. I'm, I'm in the mall, and I'm <laughs> wherever it is, you know. But uh, we're surrounded with it. 
And the reason I said what I said is, I'd be lying to you if I acted like none of it attracts me. It does. If the devil, you know, the devil doesn't use bait that doesn't work. <laughs> and all of us have something within us, and that music pulls at different parts of our hearts. And so we just need to know that, hey, even though I might like it and it might be attractive, there's a lot of sweets and things that I know I like the taste of, but I don't like what it does to me. And it's that way with music. There's music out there. It's not neutral. You can't listen indiscriminately to anything that's out there and say, this is not affecting me spiritually. Because it does. For good or for bad. And so you need to be very careful what you listen to. David played and the devil left. And there's a lot of music that Christians play today and the devil comes in. And the sad thing is we do it deliberately. And we don't, say, we don't even make the connection. People listening to, now, I, you know, I've heard some people say, well, David was a shepherd, and so he probably played country music. So country's okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure there is some country music that's okay. But I can tell you a lot of that music is talking about who's cheating on who, and, you know, you got to know when to fold them and hold them. And, you, and you, you, she left me, and, you know, I've got a pregnant cat, and all these things are going wrong. And, and just, it's just depressing. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, I've just, I really, I've heard, you know, some of the folksy people in, in the church, they'll say, oh, yeah, that, that wicked rock and roll music. A boy asked his dad one day, had, had you ever heard rock and roll when you were young? He said, yeah, one time a truckload of ducks collided with a truck of empty milk cans. That was the closest thing I came to hearing rock and roll. But, uh, and so they think this rock and roll is wicked, but country music, you know, in almost every category there's, um, well, let me say this differently. Some people will say, well, every culture has different music. We say it's just a cultural thing. In our culture, it's rock. We come from a rock culture. And you old fogies in your generation, you don't appreciate rock music. It's just, it, uh, it's not a cultural thing. Every country, I've been all over the world, every country I've been in, the principles of music are the same. In any country I've been in, when mothers want to put their babies to sleep and they sing a lullaby, lullabies will all have the same principle. None of them play a screaming electric guitar with loud drums to try to put the kid to sleep. It would make the kid neurotic. <laughs> they found even plants respond to music differently. Do you know that? I just saw a study within a month, not a Christian study, that came out that said they're showing that certain kind of music, I think it's like classical music, that plants are more productive. And they said, well, it may not have to do with it. It just might be that the vibrations are helping or something, you know. But animals respond to music. There's something within us, these vibrations, that it affects us. When soldiers go to war, there's a music for war. They don't sing as they're marching, la, 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 la. That's lullaby music, right? Then that's when you want your war music. No, I'm not going to sing that, no. <laughs> and then there's romantic music. And, and I think that's true. I think there's good romantic music. There's love songs, right? Isn't there a book in the Bible called the Song of Solomon? And so that's appropriate within the context of an appropriate relationship. Romantic music. But you don't sing marching music. You, know, you invite your fiancé over and you're going to have dinner and, and say, could I put on a little music for this to set the mood? Sure, please do that. And you play da 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 dum 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 da dum da which is, you know, that's a marching song. I know I'm, I'm carrying on a little bit, but it's making a point. The, so when people say, oh, it's a cultural thing, War music, romantic music, lullaby, these different music principles are the same in every culture. There will be cultural differences, but they fall within the principles. And so there are Christian principles for music that we need to understand. And Martin Luther, he believed very strongly about the um, 
the importance of music. Luther said, the devil takes flight at the sound of music, speaking of Christian music, as he does at the words of theology. For this reason, the prophets often combine theology and music, teaching of the truth, enchanting of the psalms and the hymns. Matter of fact, uh, you know, you look at some of the old songs and the old hymns and they had just profound theology. Sometimes it was like a sermon in a hymn. And the idea was the music was there to enhance the words, to teach and to reinforce the truth. Any of you ever read the Song of Solomon? Or, I mean the Song of uh, Moses? It's like 33 verses. I'd love to hear the music that went with that. But he was teaching them about following God and their journeys. That's quite a song. I've got a friend who uh, his family was from the Reformed Church in Finland. And he said, oh yeah, in our family, they would sing a song, 25 minutes, one song. I said, was it, you know, the same words? Oh no, no two words were the same. They would have this sermon that they'd put to music there in Finland and they would sing these sermons. Well, you know, they don't have to be long. You do have Psalm 117. It's one of the shortest chapters in the Bible, but it's right next to Psalm 119. I'd love to preach on that someday. But that's a long chapter. And then, while I'm on the subject of length and the number of words, I should probably talk about some of the popular contemporary songs that uh, we often call them praise songs. That doesn't mean that I believe that all praise songs are bad. I think there, there's an appropriate time for simple praise songs. There's some very simple songs we teach the children that have very simple words and that's wonderful. Um, but uh, the theology is not what it used to be in some of the, um, the old songs. You've probably heard the expression 7-Eleven songs. That's because they sing the same seven words 11 times. <laughs> Just over and over. And uh, I, I get kind of irritated. I like lyrics, and so I like words that mean <laughs> something. And so when people just, and so many of them just sound like love songs. And it's just a, you know, a lot of it just over and over. Oh, Jesus, you're so wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but I'm just, it's like, you know, teach me something. Uh, you know, lift me through the words. Because the, the reason for this music is there's theology in it. And when David would play on his harp, I can't help but wonder if he wouldn't also sing some truths of God. Where do you think David got his ideas for his songs? David, some, he comes from the pasture to the palace and he is a magnificent musician. And he's composed a lot of songs already, I think. He was out there surrounded by the things that God made. And he would see the mountains and he would see the majestic sunsets and he'd see the stars at night. You've read the Psalms, uh, where it talks about when I consider the heavens and the things that your hands have made. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? As the sun goes forth in its strength, he talks about the sunrise. As the dew upon the grass, he talks about the grass. You look at the Psalm, read this 23rd Psalm. You lead me beside the still waters. So many of David's Psalms were obviously in, influenced by the things that God made. And so the purpose of the music was to glorify God. But music is, it's not a neutral medium. J.S. Bach said, all music should have no other end and aim than to the glory of God and for the soul's refreshment. Were this not remembered, there's no real music, only a devilish hubbub. That's what Bach said. Something else you may or may not know. Every composition by Bach began with a JJ at the top left. And that meant it was Jesus Huvia, which meant Jesus help me. And he ended every composition with SDG. And that meant sola dia grata, to God alone be the praise. Every composition, the start and the beginning, he saw it as a divine opportunity. Martin Luther said, after theology, I give the highest place and greatest honor to music. Matter of fact, one of the things that set the Protestant Reformation going is Luther not only translated the Bible, he wrote a hymn book. They had new songs to sing because you realize at the time of Luther, 
all the monasteries, they all would come into the church and they'd chant in Latin. And it was almost hypnotic. And again, I, I got to illustrate because we're thinking about audio things, so I'm not trying to be funny, but you ever heard some of these mon monastic chants? And some of them very pleasant. It's a matter. You get all these men voices together, but often it sounds like And when I came into the church, I'd kind of come out of Eastern mysticism, went through all these Eastern religions, and they'd all get together and they'd do all these mystical chants. And uh, you'd kind of make these off tones. It's almost like spa music that's supposed to put you in a hypnotic trance. And then all of a sudden the people couldn't sing. They didn't know Latin. Luther gives them a book and it's songs. And that's why Luther, he would take some of the great music. You know that song? A mighty fortress. That was a melody the people sang sometimes even in the bars. It was a great melody and Luther said, nothing wrong with the melody. The words are terrible. I'm going to put new words to that great melody. And all of a sudden they were singing songs like that and it just, everybody was singing the songs. Who was it that said, uh, yeah, here we go. Confucius, of all the people I might quote. If one should desire to know whether a kingdom is well governed or if its morals are good or bad, the quality of its music will give you the answer. What does that bode for us as a nation? Andrew Fletcher said, I knew a very wise man who believed that if a man were permitted to take all the ballads he needed, not care who should make the laws of the nation, if he could write the ballads, the songs. Plato said, give me the music of a nation and I will change the mind of the nation. You think it's an accident what's happened to music? Or is the devil trying to do something with a nation? It's another means of communication. It's very powerful. Something about those vibrations go beyond the part of our brain that processes speech and gets down into our soul. You ever heard music that just make you weep? You know, you've heard music that just moves you to tears and you don't even know why. You may, I've heard music in other countries where I don't know what they're saying. But the music is, is uh, mesmerizing. And sometimes, you know what's neat about music? Sometimes there'll be a great song for instance, if I should just hum. Everyone know what that was? Even though I don't sing on key? The words, did you have the words in your mind? So when you hear the melodies, it brings the words back. And so by combining words, good theology, with these beautiful vibrations, the divine good music, it inspires towards truth. Oh, we can't underestimate the power of music, friends, and I, I just don't have time to, uh, to give it the attention it deserves. In the book Education, page 62, music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above, and we should endeavor in our songs of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of heavenly choirs. It's our goal here as a church, in the pastoral staff, with the music leaders, to say, Lord, what is the music, not that the world likes, but what will glorify you? What will please you? And I know sometimes we probably miss the mark, but that's our goal, is to be evaluating and studying, and it's worth studying, isn't it? To know what is truth in His Word and what is good when it comes to music. In First Testimonies 497, music, when not abused, is a great blessing, but when it is put to a wrong use, it is a terrible curse. So the purpose of music is to glorify God. Psalm 71, verse 22, Also with a lute I will praise you. I will praise your faithfulness, O my God. To you I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you, and my soul which you have redeemed. Psalm 57, I'll praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. So one of the reasons that they would sing their music is not just to teach them, it was also an outreach. The heathen will hear. I'll praise you among the nations. Music is powerfully, is a very powerful tool evangelistically. Anyway, so back to David. So God in his providence, he brings David to the palace. And David, in the time, now he wasn't there full time. Because the king would not make slaves of the people that would come to serve him in that way. He said, Jesse, can you send me your son? He will be someone who will serve me 
but he's not a slave. He's not an indentured slave. He can still go home. They were about, uh, Saul did not live in Jerusalem. Saul lived in Gibeah, which is about eight miles north of Bethlehem. So David, when he went to Saul, he went up to Gibeah. That's where the court was back then. And he'd get a message, say, you need to come help. The king is having a hard time. And he'd come and he'd spend some time. He'd play in the palace. And while he was there, this was so providential. Not only did it bless Saul, but David, by watching how things were conducted in the palace, by watching as Saul was interacting with leaders from other countries, by watching the intrigue and the jostling, and he was on the sidelines at a lot of meetings. You know, sometimes there are high-level meetings that are happening in the country, and the leaders don't notice the servants. They're not paying attention to the waiters. They're not paying attention to the butlers. They're talking. They're talking about international intrigue. David, while he's in their background, he's providing background music, he's brilliant. He's spirit-filled too. God's, he's taking it all in. And God used this providence to prepare him. Because, I mean, let's face it, there's a distance between being a shepherd and being a king. And God said, look, I need to give you a little bit of uh, a learning curve in the palace. I'm going to let you observe what's happening in the palace and how to conduct yourself. I'm going to let you learn from Saul's mistakes so you don't make the same mistakes. He'd often hear people flatter the king so they could get what they want. And it taught David, look, they'll tell the king anything to get what they want. And he said, I don't want to be fooled by that. He saw that the king would be so full of himself that he wouldn't really care about anyone else. He said, I want to be a king that really cares about the poor people. He saw the good things that Saul did. He saw the bad things that Saul did. And God was preparing David to be the greatest king of Israel as he sat in the corner and played his harp. Isn't that amazing?